Chapter 11 of Old Time Makers of Medicine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Marcetich. September 2009, Alexandria, Virginia. Old Time Makers of Medicine by James Joseph. Chapter 11 Guy de Choliac. Part one of two. One of the most interesting characters in the history of medieval medicine, and undoubtedly the most important and significant of these old time makers of medicine, is Guy de Choliac. Most of the false notions so commonly accepted with regard to the Middle Ages at once disappear after a careful study of his career. The idea of the careful application of scientific principles in a great practical way, is far removed from the ordinary notion of medieval procedure. Some observations we may concede that they did make, but we are inclined to think that these were not regularly ordered, and the lessons of them not drawn so as to make them valuable as experiences. Great art men may have had, but science, and, above all, applied science, is a later development of humanity. Particularly this is supposed to be true with regard to the science and practice of surgery, which is assumed to be of comparatively recent origin. Nothing could well be less true, and if the thoroughly practical development of surgery may be taken as a symbol of how capable men were of applying science and scientific principles, then it is comparatively easy to show that the men of the later Middle Ages were occupied very much, as have been our recent generations with science and its practical applications. The immediate evidence of the value of old-time surgery is to be found in the fact that Guy de Choliac, who is commonly spoken of in the history of medicine as the father of modern surgery, lived his seventy-odd years of life during the fourteenth century and accomplished the best of his work, therefore, some five centuries before surgery, in our modern sense of the term, is supposed to have developed. A glance at his career, however, will show how old are most of the important developments of surgery, as also in what a thoroughly scientific temper of mind this subject was approached more than a century before the close of the Middle Ages. The life of this French surgeon, indeed, who was a cleric and occupied the position of chamberlain and physician in ordinary to three of the Avignon popes, is not only a contradiction of many of the traditions as to the backwardness of our medieval forebears in medicine, that are readily accepted by many presumably educated people, but it is the best possible antidote for that insistent misunderstanding of the Middle Ages which attributes profound ignorance of science, almost complete failure of observation, and an absolute lack of initiative in applications of science to the men of those times. Guy de Choliac's life is modern in nearly every phase. He was educated in a little town of the south of France, made his medical studies at Montpellier, and then went on a journey of hundreds of miles into Italy in order to make his postgraduate studies. Italy occupied the place in science at that time that Germany has taken during the 19th century. A young man who wanted to get into touch with the great masters in medicine naturally went down into the peninsula. Traditions as to the attitude of the church to science notwithstanding, Italy where education was more completely under the influence of the popes and ecclesiastics than in any other country in Europe, continued to be the home of postgraduate work in science for the next four centuries. Almost needless to say, the journey to Italy was more difficult of accomplishment and involved more expense and time than would even the voyage from America to Europe in our time. Choliac realized, however, that both time and expense would be well rewarded, and his ardor for the rounding out of his education was amply recompensed by the event. Nor have we any reason for thinking 
that what he did was very rare, much less unique, in his time. Many a student from France, Germany, and England made the long journey to Italy for postgraduate opportunities during the Middle Ages. Even this postgraduate experience in Italy did not satisfy Choliac, however, for, after having studied several years with the most distinguished Italian teachers of anatomy and surgery, he spent some time in Paris, apparently so as to be sure that he would be acquainted with the best that was being done in his specialty in every part of the world. He then settled down to his own life work, carrying his Italian and French master's teachings well beyond the point where he received them, and after years of personal experience, he gathered together his master's ideas, tested by his own observations, into his Chirurgia Magna, a great textbook of surgery, which sums up the whole subject succinctly, yet completely, for succeeding generations. When we talk about what he accomplished for surgery, we are not dependent on traditions nor vague information gleaned from contemporaries and successors, who might perhaps have been so much impressed by his personality as to be made over-enthusiastic in their critical judgment of him. We know the man in his surgical works, and they have continued to be classics in surgery ever since. It is an honorable distinction for the medicine of the later fourteenth the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries, that Guy de Choliac's book was the most read volume of the time in medicine. Evidently, the career of such a man is of import, not alone to physicians, but to all who are interested in the history of education. Choliac derives his name from the little town of Choliac in the diocese of Mend, almost in the center of what is now the department of Lozary. The records of births and deaths were not considered so important in the 14th century as they are now, and so we are not sure of either in the case of Choliac. It is usually considered that he was born sometime during the last decade of the 13th century, probably toward the end of it, and that he died about 1370. Of his early education we know nothing, but it must have been reasonably efficient since it gave him a good working knowledge of Latin, which was the universal language of science, and especially of medicine at that time. And though his own style, as must be expected, is no better than that of his contemporaries, he knew how to express his thoughts clearly in straightforward Latin, with only such a mixture of foreign terms as his studies suggested, and the exigencies of a new development of science almost required. Later in life, he seems to have known Arabic very well, for he is evidently familiar with Arabian books, and does not depend merely on translations of them. Pagel, in the first volume of Pushman's Handbook of the History of Medicine, says, on the authority of Nikais and others, that Choliac received his early education from the village clergyman. His parents were poor, and but for ecclesiastical interest in him, it would have been difficult for him to obtain his education. The church supplied at that time, to a great extent, for the foundations and scholarships, home and traveling, of our day, and Choliac was amongst the favored ones. How well he deserved the favor, his subsequent career shows, as it completely justifies the judgment of his patrons. He went first to Toulouse, as we know from his affectionate mention of one of his teachers there. Toulouse was more famous for law, however, than for medicine, and after a time Choliac sought Montpellier to complete his medical studies. For English-speaking people, an added interest in Guy de Choliac will be the fact that one of his teachers at Montpellier was Bernard Gordon, very probably a Scotchman, who taught for some thirty-five years at this famous university in the south of France, and died near the end of the first quarter of the fourteenth century. One of Choliac's fellow students at Montpellier was John of Gaddison, 
the first English royal physician by official appointment of whom we have any account. John is mentioned by Chaucer in his Doctor of Physic, and is usually looked upon as one of the fathers of English medicine. Choliac did not think much of him, though his reason for his dislike of him will probably be somewhat startling to those who assume that the men of the Middle Ages always clung servilely to authority. Choliac's objection to Gaddinson's book is that he merely repeats his masters and does not dare to think for himself. It is not hard to understand that such an independent thinker as Choliac should have been utterly dissatisfied with a book that did not go beyond the forefathers in medicine that the author quotes. This is the explanation of his well-known expression, quote, Let of all arose the scentless rose of England, Rosa Angele was the name of John of Gaddinson's book, in which, on its being sent to me, I hope to find the odor of sweet originality, but instead of that, I encountered only the fictions of Hispanus, of Gilbert, and of Theodoric. End quote. The presence of a Scotch professor and an English fellow student, afterwards a royal physician, at Montpellier, at the beginning of the fourteenth century, shows how much more cosmopolitan was university life in those times than we are prone to think, and what attraction a great university medical school possessed even for men from long distances. After receiving his Doctor of Medicine at Montpellier, Choliac went, as we have said, to Bologna. Here he attracted the attention and received the special instruction of Bertuzio, who was attracting students from all over Europe at this time, and was making some excellent demonstrations in anatomy, employing human dissections very freely. Choliac tells of the methods that Bertuccio used in order that bodies might be in as good condition as possible for demonstration purposes, as mentions the fact that he saw him do many dissections in different ways. In Roth's Life of Vesalius, which is usually considered one of our most authoritative medical historical works, not only with regard to details of Vesalius's life, but also in all that concerns anatomy about that time, and for some centuries before, there is a passage quoted from Choliac himself, which shows how freely dissection was practiced at the Italian universities in the 14th century. This passage deserves to be quoted at some length, because there are even serious historians who still cite a bull of Pope Boniface VIII, issued in 1300, forbidding the boiling and dismembering of bodies in order to transport them to long distances for burial in their own country, as being, either rightly or wrongly, interpreted as a prohibition of dissection, and, wherefore, preventing the development of anatomy. In the notes to his history of dissection during this period in Bologna, Roth says, quote, Without doubt, the passage in Guy de Choliac, which tells of having frequently seen dissections, must be considered as referring to Bologna. This passage runs as follows. My master Bertuccius conducted the dissection very often after the following manner. The dead body, having been placed upon a bench, he used to make four lessons on it. In the first, the nutritional portions were treated, because they are so likely to become putrefied. In the second, he demonstrated the spiritual members. In the third, the animate members. In the fourth, the extremities. End quote. Roth, Andreas Vesalius, Basil, 1896. Bertuccio's master, Mondino, is hailed in the history of medicine as the father of dissection. His book on dissection was for the next three centuries in the hands of nearly every medical scholar in Europe who is trying to do good work in anatomy. It was not displaced until Vesalius came, the father of modern anatomy, who revolutionized the science in the Renaissance time. Mondino had devoted himself to the subject with unfailing ardor and enthusiasm, 
and from everywhere in Europe the students came to receive inspiration in his dissecting room. Within a few years, such was the enthusiasm for dissection aroused by him in Bologna, that there were many legal prosecutions for body snatching, the consequence doubtless of a regulation in the medical department of the University of Bologna, that if the students brought a body to any of their teachers, he was bound to dissect it for them. Bertuccio, Mondino's disciple and successor, continued this great work, and now Choliac, the third in the tradition, was to carry the Bolognese methods back to France, and his position as Chamberlain to the Pope was to give them a wide vogue throughout the world. The great French surgeon's attitude toward anatomy and dissection can be judged from his famous expression that, quote, the surgeon ignorant of anatomy carves the human body as a blind man carves wood, end quote. The whole subject of dissection at this time has been fully discussed in the first three chapters of my Popes and Science, where those who are interested in the matter may follow it to their satisfaction. After his Bologna experience, Choliac went to Paris. Evidently, his indefatigable desire to know all that there was to be known would not be satisfied until he had spent some time at the great French university where Lanfranc, after having studied under William of Salicet in Italy, had gone to establish that tradition of French surgery which, carried on so well by Mondeville his great successor, was to maintain Frenchmen as the leading surgeons of the world until the nineteenth century, Pagel. Lanfranc, himself an Italian, had been exiled from his native country, apparently because of political troubles, but was welcomed at Paris because the faculty realized that they needed the inspiration of the Italian medical movement in surgery for the establishment of a good school of surgery in connection with the university. The teaching so well begun by Lanfranc was magnificently continued by Mondeville, and Arnold of Villanova in their disciples. Choliac was fortunate enough to come under the influence of Petrus de Argentaria, who was worthily maintaining the tradition of practical teaching in anatomy and surgery so well founded by his great predecessors of the thirteenth century. After this grand tour, Choliac was himself prepared to do work of the highest order, for he had been in touch with all that was best in the medicine and surgery of his time. Like many another distinguished member of his profession, Choliac did not settle down in the scene of his ultimate labors at once, but was something of a wanderer. His own words are, quote, Et per multa tempora apparatus fui in multis partibus, end quote. Perhaps out of gratitude to the clerical patrons of his native town, to whom he owed so much, or because of the obligations he considered that he owed them for his education, he practiced first in his native diocese of Mend. Thence he removed to Lyons, where we know that he lived for several years, for in 1344 he took part as a canon in a chapter that met in the church of St. Just in that city. Just when he was called to Avignon, we do not know, though when the Black Death ravaged that city in 1348, he was the body physician of Pope Clement VI, for he is spoken of in a papal document as, quote, Venerabilis et circumspectus vir, Dominus Guido de Colliaco, Conicus et prepositus Ecclesiae Sancti Justi Lugdini, Medicusque Domini Nostri Pape. End quote. All the rest of his life was passed in the papal capital, which Avignon was for some seventy years of the fourteenth century. He served as chamberlain physician to three popes, Clement the Sixth, Innocent the Sixth, and Urban the Fifth. We do not know the exact date of his death, but when Pope Urban V went to Rome in 1367, Choliac was putting the finishing touches on his Chirurgia Magna, which, 
as he tells us, was undertaken as a solatium senectutis, a solace in old age. When Urban returned to Avignon for a time in 1370, Choliac was dead. His life work is summed up for us in this great treatise on surgery, full of anticipations in surgical procedures that we are prone to think much more modern. Nicaes has emphasized the principles which guided Guy de Choliac in the choice and interpretation of his authorities by a quotation from Guy himself, which is so different in its tone from what is usually supposed to have been the attitude of mind of the men of science of the time, that it would be well for all those who want to understand the Middle Ages better to have it near them. Speaking of the surgeons of his own and immediately preceding generations, Guy says, quote, One thing particularly is a source of annoyance to me in what these surgeons have written, and it is that they follow one another like so many cranes, for one always says what the other says. I do not know whether it is from fear or from love that they do not deign to listen except to such things as they are accustomed to, and as have been proved by authorities. They have to my mind understood very badly Aristotle's second book of metaphysics, where he shows that these two things, fear and love, are the greatest obstacles on the road to the knowledge of the truth. Let them give up such friendships and fears. Quote, because while Socrates or Plato may be a friend, truth is a greater friend. End quote. Truth is a holy thing, and worthy to be honored above everything else. Let them follow the doctrine of Galen, which is entirely made up of experience and reason, and in which one investigates things and despises words. End quote. After all, this is what great authorities in medicine have always insisted on. Once every hundred years or so, one finds a really great observer who makes new observations and wakes the world up. He is surprised that men should not have used their powers of observation for themselves, but should have been following old-time masters. His contemporaries often refused to listen to him at first. His observations, however, eventually make their way. We blame the Middle Ages for following authority, but what have we been always doing but following authority, except for the geniuses who come and lift us out of the rut and illuminate a new portion of the realm of medicine? After they have come, however, and done their work, their disciples proceed to see with their eyes and to think that they are making observations for themselves when they are merely following authority. When the next master in medicine comes along, his discovery is neglected, because men have not found it in the old books, and usually he has to suffer for daring to have opinions of his own. The fact of the matter is that, at any time, there is only a very limited number of men who think for themselves. The rest think other people's thoughts, and think they are thinking and doing things. As for observation, John Ruskin once said, quote, Nothing is harder than to see something and tell it simply as you saw it. End quote. This is as true in science as in art, and only genius succeeds in doing it well. Choliac's book is confessedly a compilation. He has taken the good wherever he found it, though he adds, modestly enough, that his work also contains whatever his own measure of intelligence enabled him to find useful. Quo juxta modicitatum me ingeni utila reputavi. Indeed, it is the critical judgment displayed by Choliac in selecting from his predecessors that best illustrates at once the practical character of his intellect and his discerning spirit. What the men of his time are said to have lacked is the critical faculty. They were encyclopedic in intellect and gathered all kinds of information without discrimination is a very common criticism of medieval writers. No one can say this of Choliac, however, and, above all, he was no respecter of authority, merely for the sake of authority. 
His criticism of John of Gaddison's book shows that the blind following of those who had gone before was his special bete noir. His bitterest reproach for many of his predecessors was that, quote, they follow one another like cranes, whether for love or fear, I cannot say. End, quote. End of part one of two.